Welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 236. And this time, we're going to talk about The Who and their second record, which is known as A Quick One in the UK. And it came out in December 1966 there. And this one is a Canadian, actually, it's an American pressing from April 1967, a few months later, which is when it was released in North America. Uh, on this continent, it was called Happy Jack for a couple of reasons, one of which was that uh, the single Happy Jack had come out between the UK release, which it wasn't on that record, and this release. And secondly, of course, because Decca Records didn't like the sexual illusions of a quick one. And thus, this version includes Happy Jack. The UK release didn't. The UK release has Heat Wave, the cover of the Martha and Vandellas hit. This version is a stereo release. There, it says it right there. But my understanding is the original source is mono and that it's reprocessed for stereo. Uh, this album actually has a bit of a tortured history when it comes to releases. If anybody knows of a really reliable version, stereo or mono with good sound quality from this era, I'd love to hear about it. Their sound is already evolving. They'd begun, of course, as this mod outfit playing overdriven R&B, but now they're rapidly evolving into pop art and to pretty conceptual musical composition. There's an enormous amount of diversity, and they're kind of like the anti-ACDC. If you consider that the bad thing, or the good thing, depending on your perspective, about ACDC is that every single album is basically a take on the same thing. The Who are the polar opposite of that. There are no two Who records which are identical, or even close to being identical. In fact, it wouldn't be until 1971 that these guys would release a full record of full-on rock tracks without any novelty tracks, without any operatic pretensions whatsoever. Of course, when they did, it'd be one of the greatest albums in rock history. The Who's previous record, My Generation, like a lot of things linked to this band, was associated with all kinds of infighting and arguing. First of all, their management team, Kit Lambert and Chris Stant, were encouraging them to move on from their R&B cover era and to write more original material. Secondly, Roger and Keith were having a rough patch because Keith's drug use was getting worse and worse already at this stage. And in fact, both Roger and Pete, in separate episodes around this time, end up in a physical fight with Keith. And Keith was also, in 1966, shopping around for some other gig because the relationships within The Who were so rough. And it's at this point when he gets together with Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page, John Paul Jones and Nicky Hopkins, and records the famous one-off track, Bex Bolero. Another relationship which went south for the band around this time was with the producer of their first record, Shel Talmy. Their record deal got cancelled, and Talmy ends up hanging on to the master tapes from the first album. It eventually gets re-released many, many, many years later, but that's why that album, one reason anyway, why it's so hard to find. They eventually signed a deal with Robert Stigwood. This is before RSO Records had been formed, and his label at the time was called Reaction. The Who put out, in this period, a whole bunch of great singles, many of which end up compiled on that fantastic compilation album, Meaty Beaty Big and Bouncy. These include Substitute, I'm a Boy, Happy Jack, Pictures of Lily, and they also end up putting out an EP called Ready Steady Who. They'd been appearing quite regularly on a TV program, which is very popular with mods, called Ready Steady Go, and it was an attempt to capitalize on that. They make this record for Stigwood at the end of 1966, and then in 1967 they spend much of the year touring the States and various tours. In doing this they had to reinvent themselves a little bit, because the mod scene was not nearly the thing in the United States that had been in Britain. It was also kind of winding down. This was 1967, the psychedelic era and the summer of love were arriving. Now, the Who were not natural hippies but they were good at being awkward and upsetting the establishment, and the tours which follow are full of a variety of what you might call incidents. The fact that their live performances ended up with Townsend smashing his guitar and Moon kicking his drums over went over well in the States. At the time, Keith also figures out that he can buy fairly high-powered firecrackers. This becomes a feature, along with regular wanton destruction of their stays in hotel rooms. This all culminates in the famous Smothers Brothers TV appearance where Keith loads up his bass drum accidentally with 10 times the amount of explosive that he wanted and it's actually pretty fortunate no one was more badly injured this of course was the 1960s before lawyers had been invented this record is made in various studios ibc pi regent sound studios and soho between august and november 1966 Kit Lambert, their manager who was producing this record, had struck a deal with a record company whereby all four of the band members were required to write songs. Townsend, of course, writes a bunch, Entwistle writes two, Moon writes two, and Roger Daltrey contributes one. The lineup, of course, is Roger Daltrey on lead vocals, Pete Townsend on guitar and occasional lead vocals, 
John Entwistle on bass, Keith Moon on drums. But on top of this, top of their usual instrumental lineup, all four members play additional instruments at various points in the record, and all of them take lead vocals at some point in the record as well. Side one starts with Run, 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 which is a Townsend song, and this is tapping right into the same energy as my generation. I don't know why this song gets excluded from subsequent compilations. I think it is amazing. It's rocking way harder than other people were rocking in 1966. Next is Boris the Spider, which apparently originates from a drinking session with John Entwistle and Bill Wyman of the Stones sitting around thinking up funny names for animals. This comes out of that. One of the very first Who records that I ever bought was Meaty Beaty, Big and Bouncy, so I've heard it a zillion times. You know, I'm fond of it, but I would put it slightly on the novelty side of novelty rock. Uh, as opposed to the rock side, um, you know, it's funny. That's followed by I Need You by Keith Moon, originally titled I Need You Like a Hole in the Head. This is actually a diss track aimed at the Beatles. Keith thought that they were making fun of him when they were getting together socially, so he's getting back at them. The great line, let us come and sit are you, and uh, there's also a quite funny impersonation of John Lennon, quite accurate actually, done by Keith, which of course he denied was about John Lennon, but was. Ant Whistle's Whiskey Man follows, it's a pretty good track actually, about uh, an imaginary drinking buddy, a mental health crisis. He also gets his French horn out here, not for the last time in the record. Then we come to another one which you kind of have to file under oddity, which is Moon's Cobwebs and Strange. This is kind of like if Keith Moon ran a circus, you'd imagine this would be the music that would play at the circus. It's basically completely manic, but it's a good excuse for some wild drum fills, and apparently every single member of the band plays a wind instrument on this track. And now at the end of side one, we come to Happy Jack, which of course had replaced Heat Wave on the North American version of the record. There is just so much to love about the song. Squarely on the rock side of novelty rock track, the production is excellent. The bass and guitar is certainly on this pressing. Just leap out of the speakers. It's, for me, the best produced track on the whole record. Moot's unique playing lights up the whole track, start to finish. It's also, I think, a different mix from the one on Meaty Beaty Big and Bouncy. There's much more thump of the bass, and it sounds to me like a mono mix. Side two starts with Don't Look Away by Townsend. Amazing song, and I think very Beatlesy. actually. It could, I think in terms of lyrical content, musical composition, production, have easily fit in any of the Beatles records from 1965 to 1966. Great track. Then we have See My Way, which is Daltrey's only songwriting contribution. Far less under unusual, I think. You have this kind of galloping beat from the rhythm section. French horn appears again. Very eccentric percussion, particularly these big cymbal strikes. You know, it's an experiment. Next we have So Sad About Us by Pete. At this point in the record, I'm thinking, Democracy Be Damned, he's the best writer. I'd like to hear more from him. This is a great track. I always think it actually would have been a great theme song to a 90s sitcom. Keith totally playing his heart out all the way through this track. The record closes with a quick one while he's away, which is a Townsend composition. It's the most substantial offering of any of the pieces of songwriting on here. It's a landmark in rock history because it's really the most ambitious piece of songwriting that occurred on any rock record in the 60s to date, and it's also the band's first tentative steps towards their rock opera future, but they're hardly tentative steps. Most people are probably more familiar with the live version of this track, which was recorded during the taping of the Rolling Stones TV special Rock and Roll Circus. It was so good, that version, that the Stones actually shelved the release of the special for years and years, decades actually, because they thought they sucked following The Who, and they did. There's lots of differences between this studio version and the one which eventually gets recorded for the Stones special. This has a much more cavernous, reverby intro. It's got quite a few stylistic and content differences to the live version. I find it, unsurprisingly, a little more sterile. It's amazing to me, actually, how well they not only reproduced this, but actually improved on this live, given the fact they didn't have a full studio at their disposal. This is not played live. You can tell, at least I think you can tell, that it's performed in several different movements and then spliced together in the studio. What to say about this record? Well, it's got quite a few great songs, some of which are well known to Who fans, others of which I think frankly are deserving of a bit of a renaissance or rediscovery. Um, it's got some pretty good songs. It's got a few songs which are worth a chuckle, but then aren't really that great once you dig into it. So it's a mixed bag. On the other hand, this record is just overflowing with energy and creativity and a little bit of danger, actually, frankly. Keith, in particular, takes several trips into orbit in the course of this record. So for me, even if it is, I would say, ultimately only four to five, it's essential hoop.